all you astronaut cadets. Welcome back aboard the International Imagination Station. Can you believe this is our sixth episode? We've done six episodes of these wonderful collaboration with NASA's Turbo Team Artemis, the mission to the moon and beyond in 2024. I'm so excited we're going back to the moon with the first female and the next man in 2024. Now, if you've missed any of the past episodes of these wonderful live Facebook and YouTube episodes, um, you can go to my YouTube channel and we posted all of them for streaming. You can binge watch them this afternoon so you can catch up, all right? Now, today we have a special NASA engineer. We have a super delightful featured guest artist, a good friend of mine. I'll introduce them both in just a second. But first, let's take a look at this video. That's the uh, NASA's gateway. This is the drawing lesson we're gonna do today. It's the moon orbiting space station called Gateway. Let's watch this video. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human-rated systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust lunar lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon, something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out of the halo orbit and once again to sling the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. With each successful mission, Artemis ushers in the next wave of men and women to explore our moon and prove that together we are ready to go beyond. Oh, that, I was so wrapped up with the video. That was so awesome. Of course, I have my cool. I'm such a NASA fan. I'm a, I'm a NASA geek. I've got all my patches. Yay. And wait, we got to put the Artemis up there. All right, now we're going to start with a warm-up drawing of the gateway, all right? But before I do, I'm going to have uh, Patricia. Hey, Patricia. Hi, Patricia and Jack. Can we just get them? There's Patricia and Jack. There are uh, my collaborators, my co-hosts, co-creators. Uh, Jack's our director. Wave, Jack, one more time. Jack, you're, just, you're so awesome. And then Patricia's our technical director and basically holds everything all together. So thank you guys so much. Now, go ahead and grab my hand cam. I want to show the, uh, all you adults and grandparents and grandparents and kids. These are the uh, episodes you've missed. If you haven't seen these, these are on YouTube. And check them out. This is the uh, episode one. This is the Ryan Space Capsule. This is episode two, the SLS, the Space Slot System. 
episode two. It's a, these are about an hour long. These were all live. This is episode three, the Orion Crew Survival System. This was the, in, the re-entry spacesuit that the astronauts wear. And then episode four, I had to do the tall ways because it's the, uh, the, the uh, mobile launcher, NASA's mobile launcher. Isn't that awesome? And, you know, it's not to technical specs, but we had our cool uh, NASA engineer, Claudia, up there. She's waving. And then episode uh, five, which was the last one a couple weeks ago, we did the uh, um, the 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 XEMU. Am I right, Jack? Did I get that? The X. Oh, my goodness. That's great. And we had the we had the uh, Katrina, the engineer for the XEMU. We had her kids and we had Jack, Elizabeth and Evelyn which is Jack and Patricia Moore's children. Are they with us today, Jack and Patricia? Uh, and we have... Uh, okay, look, it's, uh, it's our sixth. They're tall, it's at the sixth episode, so it's, no, it's not like this big, exciting thing. It's all, you know, humdrum now for the kids, right? Now, Brandon, you have your two kids with you. You have a Violet and Blu-ray, is that right? Yes, I do. Well, they Brandon are... Ray, everybody. Brandon, I'm going to give you a full steam, full on uh, cool intro in a second. I just want to say hi to you. Can I say hi to, to Brian Banker just real quick? He's our engineer from hey, everyone. NASA. There's Brian Banker. We can't wait. I'll give you guys all a good intro in a second. But let's do a warm up. Um, come on back to my hand cam. Now, for the warm up, what we're going to do is I want to get everyone to draw with me. All you you parents and grab grab my hand cam here. And I want you parents and you grandparents and you aunts and your uncles and all you adults to draw in too, okay? All the kids, of course. But what I want you guys to do is have a creative license to flop. Take that risk, take that, uh, that give yourself permission to go beyond your comfort zone and try something new. Most of the people that I talk to, most adults think they can't draw the straight line, but you can, you can, I promise, I guarantee you. So let's just, I'll show you. If you can put a dot, if you can draw a dot on your paper, you can draw in 3D. All right. If you could write your name, you can draw on 3D. So you put two dots straight across from each other and then take your finger, put your finger right here in the middle. This is just one way to draw a really cool four shortened square. When you draw a four shortened shape, what you're doing is you're squishing and distorting. The best example I have for this is the Minion Goggle. I, I love the Minions. One of my old students, my alumni students, was one of the team that created the Minion characters for Despicable Me. And so I'm just a huge fan of these guys. Um, isn't that cool that one of my students actually it was the guys who created Frozen characters and Minion characters and Toy Story characters. I love that. Look at the look at the goggles. Now watch. Watch what happens to the goggles. As you twist it away, it becomes distorted. I call this foreshortening. Does that make sense? All right, here's a good example. Let's use the cool NASA logo. All right now, watch what happens. As I twist it away, it becomes a squished shape. Squish and distort. So write that down, would you? Squish and distort. If you can squish and distort, you can draw on 3D. If you can write your name, you can draw on 3D. Now, draw a four shortened square. Okay, that's just take your finger and squish it. See, you're squishing a square. And th this will be, this is go going to be how we create the central hub of the gateway. And when we start drawing the original drawing, the, the main drawing. Now, don't go straight across, go uphill, follow the lines you've already drawn, okay? I'm gonna call these direction, think of a compass, and I'm gonna call this direction during the lesson, I'll be saying, okay, go, direction northeast, direction northwest. These are drawing direction compass that I use, and most artists will use these angles. There's four angles that most artists use most of the time. Now, not all the time, but most artists will use these directions. I just put them together and coined them the drawing compass, but most artists use these instinctually. Think of a compass, right? And you foreshorten the compass and it becomes these angles here. See? So go uphill here. So these these lines right here are direction south what? Southwest. And this line coming down here is direction southeast. And we're going to be using these these directions. Here's shading. It's one of the 12 words of drawing. There's 12 words. If you learn these words, you can draw anything in 3D. Now, at the end of the show, you're going to see a link to my Draw 3D site. These are free. And I put two free ebooks for you guys, drawing journals for you, a beginning journal and an advanced intermediate journal. So there's a bunch of free stuff. Get this, print this up, print this up. It's a great reference for you to be able to draw any of these, uh, any of these Artemis lessons. You ha you need these words to help you put things together in 3D. You, you know, defining 
what shapes look like and how they fit together. So I'm going to put a dot right here. If you can draw a dot, you can draw anything in 3D. Now, right down the middle, follow the guideline. Look at this. I'm going to go straight down here, a guideline. See that? And then out here, I'm just going to put a practice shape. I'm just going to do a four short and circle right in the middle. Like a, maybe it's like a propeller. This could you could put wings on this, and it could be a propeller for an airplane, right? But I'm going to make this like a. Uh, um, is this would this be the halo or the whole organize or the whole system is the halo, Brian? That uh, if so, I was trying. To... Yeah, what you're doing right there that would be halo, and the cube to the left that's the PPE. All right, so this was just a, a just as a warm up. Now, just just for crazy sake, watch this. Use the guideline again. Watch this. Let's just put a whole bunch of other. Look at this. Four short and circle. Take it gets smaller. That's the word size. That's. The, the word size and you guys look at how scribble see be loose and sketchy enjoy it and as jack moore would say chase your curiosity you want to do what look at this go crazy look at this one let's put another one on the top chase your curiosity i love that jack moore i just love that one down here watch this go through it and then you can draw now some of you out there you probably remember this shape from my from my old tv series I, you saw this in the opening, the Secret City. Do you remember that? You guys remember that? So oh, this yeah. is a, a nice, uh, nice little flashback to the 1980s. So you can shade this. This was just just a sketch, just a warm up. The important thing I want to get across in this one is there's 12 words to learn. I call them the Renaissance words. I hope you download that chart. There's the drawing compass that you can use as a reference to keep your drawing lined up. I want you guys to give yourself during this hour the creative license to flop. Give yourself permission to fail. You got to fail to succeed we, because this is what I keep telling my children during my Art Academy live webcast. A little plug there. My Zoom live Art Academy webcast daily, 10 o'clock on Central Time. Be, look at stress is on the bus. Some of, everybody out with the open mic say beep, beep. Beep, 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 beep. Ah, you guys actually did it. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> beep, beep. All right, I'm going to take a moment to introduce uh, our my our guest artist. Now, first of all, before I do that, I'm going to take everybody take your finger and go, Yahoo. I'm going to give you guys a big creative ninja squirrel hug. Look at that. Look at that. Now, do you guys love these puppets? Someone say you love these puppets. We love them. We love the puppets. All, They're great. I want, I, now, you guys, I want somebody out there on YouTube and Facebook on the text box to Diane. Diane Kelly's gonna be answering all of our social media comments. Please uh, engage us, we're live. This is the fun part of being live. So I need you guys to tell me, do you love these puppets? Look at this, I'm gonna go back to my hand cam. Look at this, these are all inspired. Every one of these, the pencil power, Okay, one more time. Everybody say pencil power. Pencil power. Pencil power. Pencil power. That my ninja hug, my Yahoo, my I'm watching you. I see you. All these puppets. You guys are you guys are genius artists. These are all inspired by our guest artist, uh, Brandon Ray. He's an old student of mine, a viewer of the Secret City, and he's worked with Sesame Street, with Lego, with Disney. And with Mark Kissler, Brandon Ray, say hi to everybody. Hey, hello everyone. How are you all doing? I'm so glad all of you are joining us today. This is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm so glad you're here. And then we have a, a, a NASA guest artist, or NASA guest engineer, and I'm sure he's an artist too. He's like Mr. Renaissance, man. I call him master of the universe. <laughs> and he's got an incredible title. I'm gonna, I love your title. I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna do it right now. Ready? This is, uh, ready? Okay, everybody get ready. This is Brian Banker, and he's the Habitation and Logistics Outpost Systems Lead for the Gateway Program. You got it. Yeah! I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Well, Brian, I'm so glad. And I, if, if this is anything like a rehearsal, it's going to be our best show yet. Your stories were fantastic. So uh, let's, uh, what's next, Patricia? Oh, Jack and Patricia. <laughs> I want to agree. Hi, Jack and Patricia. Hi. You two, take it away. Hey. So, I'm just so excited. I can't even contain that's myself. That's okay. And we also guys... have Diane, too, Mike. Uh, uh, Mark, sorry, Mark. Um, Diane yeah. is going to help um, help us out on the social media. And so, if you have any questions that you want uh, want answered during the event, just type them in, and Diane will let us know, and we'll be able we'll to answer. Hi, Hi, everyone. Can't wait to get your questions. 
So you guys go ahead, take it away, Jack and Patricia right. and Brian and uh, Brandon. Go ahead and start your main drawing, and you, I'm just going to listen and draw. All right, sounds cool. great. All right, so let's um, start with, like, the very simple, basic question. So um, before we get into the gateway, we all we want to know all about you, Brian. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to NASA and maybe some of the fun stories um, you told us, uh, told us last night. <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Brian Banker. I actually grew up in a small town in Iowa called Ames. And, you know, and when growing up in Iowa, NASA was always something that was super, super cool. I was aware of it. You know, the shuttle was launching a bunch. But, you know, working for NASA isn't exactly something that um, you, you think you can do. Not a lot of people uh, grow up and do that. But I knew since an early age that I wanted to be an engineer. And so I thought, you know, I'm just gonna pick the hardest major I can think of. So I chose to go to Iowa State and study aerospace engineering thinking, you know, I'm probably not smart enough. Um, I'll probably do this for a year and then switch to something else because it's just gonna be too hard for me. And then I got there and I started to realize, man, you know, I'm as smart as everyone else here. And a lot of these people are going off and working for NASA. And so when it came time, I got an interview for NASA and I actually didn't get it my first time, but that was okay. I tried applying 52 times to one of our, the companies wow. that we work for down here. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to get one job offer out of that. So I went and worked for that company. They were awesome for a year working on the space shuttle. And then I, that's when I really, I was hooked. I knew I wanted to go back to NASA. So I tried again the next year and and we were really fortunate because uh, you know i grew up in iowa at the time our big rivals in football were university of nebraska and so you know we played them every year and it just so happened that we played them the year or the uh the same time as our career fair and so the nasa recruiter grew up in nebraska and loved nebraska football so he used to always find a way to make our career fair uh, because he liked watching Nebraska football beat beat us up in football. And so it's so weird that I ended up at NASA in part because of our rival football team. But ah. you never really know how things work. Um, oh, that's but you just, so good. What a great story. Yep, you just keep trying. So when I came into NASA, I actually worked um, as a propulsion engineer at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and that's where I live now. So I moved all the way from Iowa uh, a, a state that has about 3 million people in it to Houston, which is a city that has 3 million people. So it was a big change for me, um, but I, I really love it down here. And I worked as a, a, a propulsion engineer. So people say, wow, you're a rocket science. Yeah, scientist. I love that. I was, I was thinking that just as you said it. Wow, yep. he's a real life rocket scientist. But, you know, for me, that can be kind of intimidating, just like doing all of this drawing. And so the way I described what I did then is I was, I'm just the fanciest plumber you'll ever meet. But at the end of the day, I'm just plumbing. I'm moving rocket propellant from a tank to an engine and I got valves and all of these things. So, you know, I used to tell my mom, look, don't worry about it. If you ever got a toilet that you need fixed, you come call me and I'll fix it. No problem. <laughs> That's um, awesome. But, I got to work on a lot of really, really cool projects, um, doing everything from jetpacks to robots that fly around space. There's the jetpack that I helped build. So this is called Safer. And astronauts, they're still using it. When they go on a spacewalk, they wear this little uh, jetpack. And you can see on the right kind of where it sits on the, on the astronaut. And that way, um, and fortunately, Space shuttle can't you, you, they want to go back and looks like you're you're breaking up, Brian. I think your video froze. So. Uh, well, we can go ahead and uh, uh, I'll come back to the drawing. We'll we'll pull uh, have him maybe re log in. Yeah. That's the joy of live, right, Patricia? <laughs> yeah, it is. And the joy of live is like ah. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, no. since we're getting into the drawing, maybe we'll take this opportunity to introduce the PDF. There we go. That's a great idea. So, Oh, excellent. That's what our, I'm using Our drawing right sessions are based on something that NASA's putting out. Uh, the How to Draw program gives us an opportunity to learn about how to draw all these really cool elements of, of this, uh, how we're going to get back to the moon and beyond. So let's share this uh, PDF real quick. 
So this gives you a good sense of where to start. It gives you a background. Um, the cover page here points out some of the more interesting elements that we'll be talking about today. But as you scroll down, you'll see that it starts with the very basic shapes, kind of like what Char uh, Mark was talking about early on. Uh, blocking things out, getting your basic shapes, kind of starting really big and then working your way down into the finer details. And so that's how this lesson progresses in the PDF. And Diane, can you do us a favor and drop that in the chat so folks can find that? Absolutely, just put it in there. And our YouTube friends, just to give you the heads up, sometimes the links don't show through, so just be sure to check out Mark's broadcast on Facebook. Okay, Perfect. awesome, thank you for that. And so at the very uh, beginning, we also have a little bit of an overview of the Artemis program. So it kind of gives you a sense of how all these pieces fit together, uh, how exciting it is. You know, and, and to me, it's amazing to imagine flying in space for three days, you just launched off the Earth, and now you're arriving at this outpost, and you're gonna dock with that, and that becomes your base camp while you're getting ready to go down to the surface. So this is a really cool activity, and we're excited to have uh, Brian here today to help us uh, engage and, and explore this thing with our imaginations. All right, and I think Brian's back. You wanna test your mic again, Brian? Yeah, can you all hear me? Yep, we're yeah. good, we're good, awesome. awesome. All right, so hey, we I, talked I, quick about the jetpack. Oh, go yeah, ahead, Mark. Well, I just want to interrupt one second. What you said about how you tried 52 times and you didn't get in the first year, but you got in the second year, that is a powerful story and just how uh, the, the, uh, the importance of perseverance and chasing your dream. Definitely. Yep. Yeah, and that's just what you've got to do. You know, a lot of engineering, we think about all the successes, but a lot of engineering um, is about failing and, and keep trying and getting better and learning from, from maybe what didn't go right the first time. Exactly. And just, you know, slowly and steadily uh, learning and improving. Everyone thinks, you know, maybe at NASA, you got to be a brilliant person. And that's really not the case. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be here if you had to be a genius, right? Ah. But it's all about keep trying if you fall down get back up knowing how to work as a team and and then slowly and steadily you know you combine everyone's talent and you can do these really really amazing things um like building jetpacks or building a, a gateway very cool and speaking of gateway why don't that's a perfect segue why don't you tell us um about the gateway and kind of go through the different pieces um that you'll you'll find on the gateway yeah so uh, as we mentioned before, Gateway is actually a, a lunar orbiting platform um, that we plan to launch in uh, late 2023, which is, I mean, I know that seems like a long time away, but for a full spacecraft that's going to the moon to launch three years from now is absolutely amazing. We are doing things um, faster and more efficiently than, than we've done it at NASA in a long, long time. So. Um, the first, one of the first parts of Gateway is the power and propulsion element. We like to call it the PPE. And that is, yeah, here you go. You're seeing it right now. Um, so this is uh, kind of the bus of the spacecraft. It's got all the propulsion. In the middle there, that's the halo. That's the part I work on. Um, this is the ascent element from the lander. So this is, and that's the descent element. That's the part that will actually take the astronauts down to the ground. Um, the other part that you saw fly in from the other side is the logistics module. And there you see is Orion that will actually bring the astronauts there. So Gateway is really uh, the place that the astronauts go to um, prior to going down to the surface of the moon. And it's kind of the stopping point. And because of that, it's not like this huge thing like the space station. I like to think of uh, the space station as like an apartment. Uh, I think maybe a two or three bedroom apartment. So it's pretty spacious, you know. Um, you can spend a long time there, but Gateway, since we're really just a stop point to check out all your, your hardware, make sure your lander's in good shape before you go down to the surface of the moon, and then once you come back from the surface of the moon, kind of collect all your things and get ready to come home, um, Gateway is really only about the size of, of like a, an RV or a recreational vehicle. So it's much, much, much smaller. And it's really just kind of, like we said, it's that outpost, it's that place to stop, make sure everything's working all right before you commit to going to the moon. And eventually we hope that we can also use Gateway as the stopping point to go on to, to Mars. Very cool. 
All right, so um, so you talked about the PPE, the power propulsion element. Um, so um, for those for those of, of you who may not be familiar with what that is, it, it uses solar electric propulsion. So Brian, why don't you tell us a little bit of, about what solar electric propulsion is and how it works? Yeah, so uh, solar electric propulsion is pretty cool. Um, you know, traditionally with rocket propellants, the way we do things is you take an oxygen and a fuel and you burn them and you create a really, really hot gas and you throw that out the backside of the engine and that pushes you forward. Um, and those work really great. It's what we need to use to get off the, the, the earth and into space because they, pr they produce a lot of thrust or a lot of force. Um, but they're, they're not as efficient. If you think of it like a car, the gas mileage isn't as good. The cool thing about um, solar electric propulsion is we can use a, a propellant, we call it xenon, it's, it's just an element. And instead of burning it with something, what you're able to do is use uh, electricity that you gather from those big solar arrays that you can see. And that's one of the reasons they're so big on the PPE. And you can charge up that xenon and then use electrical forces and magnetic forces out of an engine that's called a hall thruster. And you're, you're able to throw that xenon really, really fast out of the back end. And those are the white streaks that you see coming out of the back end of the picture on the left. And so, although the, the downside is it doesn't produce very much thrust. So, you know, a big, big, big engine might be a pound or two pounds of thrust, but it's very, very fuel efficient. And what that allows us to do is stay on orbit near the, near the moon for 15 plus years and keep us in the same orbit. We can, hopefully we, we can change orbits a little bit. One of the cool things with um, this type of propulsion plus the orbit that we're going into is that you'll be able to take the lander and go to a bunch of different places on the surface of the moon very uh, efficiently. And so that, that means that we can bring more research and science down to the surface of the moon. And we can also take more moon rocks with us home uh, and do just better research. And so here, I, I believe this is the south pole of, of the moon. I think one of those craters is Shackleton Crater, which I'm sure people have heard a lot of. And you can see the shadows going around. And what you'll notice is some places are always shadow and some places are always in the light. And what we're hoping to do um, is find one of those places where we can set up a base in a place where there's always sunlight because that's a lot safer. But we think that in those dark regions that there might actually be ice. And I believe we've confirmed that there's ice there. And what, we're, what we want to eventually be able to do is you can take that ice and melt it. And now you can create uh, water that the astronauts need. And eventually you can do what's called in situ resource utilization, where you can um, take that water, that H2O, and split the molecule and now you've got hydrogen and oxygen which is a really good rocket propellant it's actually what we used on the space shuttle and now you can think of it like a gas station that we've set up on the moon so you can land with your tanks empty refill your tanks and then come home that's come so back cool. to the gateway oh yeah. my gosh and you've done you you did some research in that area didn't you i think you said you went to hawaii is that right yeah so it was pretty cool early on in my career um, when I was doing, when I was a space plumber, um, we went to the side of Mauna Kea, which is one of the dormant uh, volcanoes on the big island of Hawaii. And here you can see, this is a colleague of mine, Bill, talking to um, some, some of the press there. And you can see to his right was a small rocket engine. So some of the teams went and took the volcanic ash on the side of this dormant volcano. And it, volcanic ash is actually a lot like um, uh, lunar regolith. So they took that ash and they put it in special machines that was able to strip off oxygen from that dirt. And then they gave us the, the oxygen. We liquefied it into a, a, a usable rocket propellant and actually fired a small rocket engine. And we did this all on the side of a dormant volcano. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that is so cool. All right, <laughs> so let's talk about HALO. So HALO is an acronym for the Habitation and Logistics Outpost, and that's kind of your area. So tell us about HALO and, and what it would be like um, for the astronauts as they enter HALO for the first time on their mission um, to the Gateway and what you would find inside. And so I, and yeah. I have a leading question for that, Brian. So in all of our drawings, and I'm noticing this with the space station too, everything is a cylinder. It looks like a Coke can. Why? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. So so the first the first one is uh, Halo is the first um, habitable element of Gateway. So it's the first place that a person could actually survive inside. And that really answers your question. Coke cans are one of, believe it or not, one of is are an engineering marvel. They can hold a bunch of pressure inside of them without blowing up, yet they're really, really lightweight. And that's why we like Coke cans. That's why we fly Coke cans. They're very um, strong for their weight. And so, whereas in the PPE, there's no pressure inside of that. It's all space inside of it. Um, so it, it can be a square, that's fine. But inside of this, this part called Halo that needs to be pressurized, that's why we use the Coke can shape. And that's why a lot of our modules end up looking that way because it's really, really strong for how, how heavy it is. Um, well, and so I'm having a Halo, time making a cylinder, so don't, don't pressurize this one. <laughs> <laughs> so as I mentioned, Halo is the first um, crude element. And that just means, you know, as I mentioned, the, the astronauts can actually go inside. We're in a way you can think of them, think of us as kind of the hub of, of Gateway in that we're the place where everything comes and meets together. We are actually bolted onto the PPE and we fly, we launch from Earth with them in November of 2023, as I mentioned. And then um, later on, um, a logistics module, which is another tin can full of cargo. Um, so things like food and clothes and science and stuff for maybe spacesuits to go down to the surface of the moon, that all launches up in, in a cargo module. That's being built uh, by a company called SpaceX. Um, Halo is being built by a company called Northrop Grumman. So we're working with companies all over the nation to help put this together. So that meets up. Then on the other side, you see here swinging around, that's the lander. And we're also partnering with, uh, with several companies to build landers to help us take our crew down. And once all of those pieces are there, then you can see the Orion comes and docks in. So Halo is the thing right there in the middle that everyone, it's kind of the meeting point for Gateway. And then, you know, so if you're an astronaut on, on Orion, you know, you think, man, gosh, space has to be so complex. But if you think of it like you're on a vacation, what's the first thing you do when you get into a, a hotel room or an RV? Well, you unpack, right? That's what our astronauts will do too. They'll make sure everything's safe inside of Halo. Then they'll open the hatch, crawl inside, and then probably the first thing they're gonna do is go into the logistics module and start unpacking that. So they'll take out all the food and clothes and supplies and oxygen and get all of those hooked in um, because two of the crew members are gonna stay on Halo and then two of the crew members are gonna go on HLS. So they'll spend maybe five days getting everything ready getting HLS set up. In Halo, we've got actually a place to exercise. So there'll always be somebody in there working out, keeping strong, keeping their body strong um, so that their muscles don't atrophy and their bones stay strong. Um, and meanwhile, everyone else is just moving around, getting things set up. You're just kind of laying out home for a little while. And then two crew members will get inside of uh, HLS, two astronauts will. They'll depart and go down to the surface of the moon. Originally, to begin with, we think that'll be about seven days that they'll spend down there. Meanwhile, the other two crew members will continue to uh, work out. They'll um, set up lots of science experiments and, and do a lot of cool research that, we, that you can really only do around the moon. Um, and then, you know, after seven days, the astronauts down the surface will come back up uh, on the lander, meet back up at Gateway. They'll get all their, their moon rocks together, kind of get everything closed up on Gateway and then come back home in Orion. That's really cool. So um, I, we have a question that has to do with Halo and it's from Emma and I think she's from Scotland and she wants to know how do you clean the Gateway between each of its visitors, sets of astronauts? <laughs> That's a great question, and that's something that we're really struggling with. Um, so one of the things that we learned in Apollo was that the moon dust is really, really bad for all of your equipment and for the crew members. So you can think of it like on Earth, you go to a beach and the sand is nice and soft and rounded because it's been scrubbed by air and water for a long, long time, centuries. Well, that's not happening on the moon. So all of that dust is really sharp, and we're really concerned that some of that's gonna get inside and come back and how do we clean up after that? 
And so we're looking at special vacuum cleaners, special filters, all sorts of brushes um, to clean that stuff off before they come back to Halo. But then when they get back to Halo, before they go home, a lot of what they'll be doing is doing that cleanup. They'll be making sure dust is, is, is knocked down. Um, they'll be wiping things with disinfectant pads. You know, all of those things that you, you and your parents have to do at home, we've got to do on I Gateway. Got, I, I've got to interrupt right here because my son Mario is the savant cleaner. He's my special abilities boy. Mario, they're talking. He can't hear you, but Mario's on. Everybody wave to Mario. Hi. And Mario, uh, he is, He his whole life is cleaning. He loves cleaning. So he, look at right now, he's getting so excited. So when you're talking about all the cleaning, the vacuums and all the special things, uh, Mario, I nominate Mario to be your your Halo official cleaner up there, Mario. Give me <laughs> thumbs up. Give me thumbs up, Mario. I, I wanted to make sure you got in there each episode. I love you, son. All right, back back to the hands and back to our guest. Yeah. Well, I so have a, one I have a thing... quick observation. If I could jump oh, go in. ahead. So what, I'm seeing a lot of uh, patterns here, right? So we, t we talk about when the drawing that we start really big and we kind of work our way down to the detail. With the International Space Station, you know, we had these big components that we assembled on orbit, you know, and, and I'm curious, you know, uh, Brandon or B-Ray, you've got a really unique style where you kind of do the same kind of thing, uh, same thing with the compositing, where you take big things, you create shapes, and then you work your way down. Can you talk a little bit about your, uh, your technique? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when I'm animating, I always start out with simple structural elements, too. And it's usually just rough shapes. Uh, I'll make an outline called a storyboard, which is like a really simple comic book that's super fast and furious and sketchy. And once the story is formed, you got a solid structure. Then you go back and you start adding more and more details on afterwards. And that's that's the process of animation. You work out the structure and the story first. And once you know that that's communicating and functioning the way you want it to, then you go back and do all the fun little details and stuff like that. So let's yeah, take a look at some of your work. Yeah, I was about to say that. We got to see as we got to see Brandon's animation. It's so yeah. awesome. Because when I think animation, I'm thinking cartoons, but this is very different. Let's take a look. I don't even know where to start. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it looks like you have some elements there that are actual 3D models and some that are just flat paper. What's going on there? Well, you know, as a as as somebody who does this for a living, I got it. I do whatever kind of animation people need. I don't really just specialize in one sort of thing. I do have a favorite style. I love doing paper animation. And so the yeah, the examples you saw right there are anything from flat two-dimensional pieces of paper that are paper puppets, kind of like uh, Mr. Mark Kistler was showing earlier, the paper puppets, and uh, construction paper animated together with stop motion animation, which is a series of photographs stitched together to make actual movement when they're played in succession. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, it's 2D, and some stuff is 3D too. Sometimes I have to build 3D sets and 3D models, and. Uh, my wife and my kids get to help me on that stuff. It's here. I'm just gonna put this up here. Pretty fun. Animation. Aha! You genius, Brandon <laughs> Ray. You are a genius paper animator. Oh yeah. Well, Brandon, you... Are you proud of my little puppets? Did you? I love it, man. It's like the the student so teaches cool. the teacher, right? Yes. <laughs> and, and all my creative inspiration from early on started from watching 
the secret city and learning all those magic words about they could go they, people could go to your uh, website to, to see some of your animations they can also go to my uh, Brandon Ray's going to be a uh, a uh, feature special guest at my uh, Zoom Fine Arts Academy, and it's if you want to see some more of his animation, go to my website. Go to click on Fine Arts Academy, and you can check it out. Patricia and Jack, you guys are guests too. Just so you you remember, yeah, you're coming we, on. We remember. We haven't forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Good luck on our calendar. <laughs> so, folks, if you guys right. are watching along, be sure to send those questions in to Facebook. We've got about 20 minutes left in the broadcast, and I think we've got a few that are coming in. Thanks, Diane, for sending those. Yeah. So, um, so Diane, why don't you um, ask the? Why don't, I'll let you ask a few of the questions since you sent them to me. So I'm going to come to you. Sure. We have a couple of questions um, on YouTube. House of Clap would like to know. Was the inspiration for your art from Monty Python's Flying Circus? <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> oh, that, that's from okay. Uh, you, you know, I did watch some Monty Python back in the day. Uh, so yes, I'm sure that's one of the influence, especially the cutout style animation. Yes, uh, that's absolutely. <laughs> All right, what's the and next? We question? have a great question. Good yes. Question. Our next question is from Facebook, from Steve Hatman Alby Jr. He wanted to know, are you involved with designing the minions? Me? No, I I was not. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not involved with uh, with that or uh, I, I have Mark, done some Disney one projects, students, right? But yeah, one of Mark's other students, I think. Oh, yeah. Involved. I've had a lot of students work. In fact, I did some of my um, these are some of the students that I had here. If you want to, uh, I, the guys who created Frozen Olaf for my students, the, the ladies and gentlemen who created the Minions. I, these are mashups I did for Comic Cons, but the guys who created the backgrounds for Lucas Films for BB-8. Of course, I put Minions in everything. I'm, and then of course, my favorite Kung Fu Panda, uh, uh, the um, Rex Grignon, the director. He, he directed us. He won an Emmy for his work on uh, Madagascar. So uh, just so proud of all my students who went on to become uh, professional artists. And it just goes back to that. If you love art and you love being creative, you too, you can be an animator for DreamWorks or Pixar or Disney or NASA. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Brian, we were we were talking earlier about how um, how NASA uses artists. Um, at the beginning of, of in the engineering concepts for our rockets and our spacecraft. So why don't you talk a little bit about that process, how we start from the very beginning conceptual and then get to the point where we are today. Yeah, so so just like we saw here and, and like we all did uh, are doing at home, you know, we start with very basic ideas. You know, the, the thought of a whole spacecraft can be really daunting at the beginning. Um, I couldn't imagine all of the little details that, that go along with Gateway right at the beginning. But what we do is we break it down into basic parts. And, and so we might say, all right, well, I need something to do, you know, to move me around the space. All right, I'm gonna make that a square and call that a PPE. And then I need something where everyone meets. So I'll make a cylinder and maybe we'll call that gateway. And, oh, it's gotta have a port here and a port there so that this other thing called logistics and module can come in and we, oh, we need something, we need the lander, so we need a place for that. And then, oh, the crew needs to get in and out, so so we need some place for the Orion to come in. And so you just start with very basic ideas, very basic shapes, and you start thinking about how they relate to each other. And then you can add a little bit more detail. Um, and then you, you, you get a little bit further along and you see, all right, now I need this other thing uh, or, or the, I need to do, we call them functions. It's just kind of thinking of what does the spacecraft need to do? And then you add more detail and you refine and you refine, you refine. But it all starts with those basic shapes, those basic building blocks and kind of how they connect together. Um, and then it's amazing that after not very much time at all, you get all of this detail and, and then wow, before you know it, there's a whole spacecraft right there. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Um, so, so Gateway is is um, for those of you just kind of following up from the, from what we were talking about earlier. Um, Gateway is a part of NASA's Artemis program, and Artemis, of course, is our new human lunar exploration program to take um, people, humans, back to the moon with our first woman and the next man um, in 2024. And so, um, 
So Gateway is going to be a really integral part of that. So I, you talked a little bit about kind of how it fits together, um, but but why why do we need Gateway? What makes it uh, a unique and important um, to be a part of the Artemis program? Yeah, so the big thing about Gateway is it helps make extended presence for humans on the moon. It, it makes it more sustainable. Um, it, the way the orbital mechanics work out um, and the orbit of Gateway it allows you to go to a whole bunch of different places on the moon um, very sustainably. It allows you to bring a lot of equipment down, a lot of science down, a lot of um, moon rocks back. And so it's it's just positioned in this place that allows us to, to um, get to anywhere we need to go very efficiently. And that'll help us have extended presence out um, deeper into space. Um, as we think about space exploration, you know, we, we walked, and, or we crawled and then we walked and now we're we're jogging and and it's really a good practice point too for eventually going out um going out to mars so it's it's in a cool place where you can get home quick if you need to if you've got a problem but yet you you're practicing the the skill sets and the equipment that you'll need to one day go on go on to mars so because of that it fills a lot of really uh, good needs that we have um, as we try and extend further and further into space. Awesome. All right. So it looks like Diane's got another question that kind of fits perfectly into what we're talking about. Yes, we were wondering over here um, when it um, referring to the gateway machine, how is it injured to orbit around the moon? That's a great question. So um, we actually are doing things a little bit different with Gateway. We're partnering a ton um, with industry. And so we are actually, um, Halo and PPE will launch together first, and they're gonna go on a commercial rocket. And we still don't know which rocket that'll be. We're still working that out. Um, but they'll actually, that rocket will take us up into space and then since um, PPE has solar electric propulsion, we'll turn on those thrusters and circle the way uh, those orbits work is you kind of spiral out into the orbit uh, around, around, the, uh, around the moon. And then the same thing with the other elements. Uh, the other elements will launch uh, uh, commercially up the, the logistics module well and parts of the, the lander get assembled, but they'll all, all launch on, on commercial rockets and then, of course, Orion will come launching on on the SLS, and that's how the astronauts will actually get to Gateway. Oh, that's really interesting. All right, Diane, I think you have another one as well. Yes, we have one more from YouTube. And the question is, what is the size of the Gateway and about how many people fit? Yeah. So initially um, the again, you can think of the halo, which is the part that the crew can actually live in. Um, it's it's about the size of an RV, more or less, and and initially four people uh, can can stay on Gateway, and again two of them will eventually go down to the moon. The other two will hang out in in Halo and in on the Orion, um, which is docked to the Halo, um, for about seven days, and then they'll rejoin uh, the the crew members down on the surface of the moon. Will get back into the lander and come up to Gateway. Um, we do hope that eventually, we're working with some of our international partners like ESA and JAXA, that we can add additional modules onto Gateway. Um, that's what we hope. We don't know exactly for sure. We're, all of those, that stuff is still in planning and, and talks. Um, but then that could even allow uh, uh, more astronauts to, to live on Gateway for longer times, hopefully up to 30 or 60 days. But again, that's, that's where we, we think we're going or we hope we're going, and at least for now, um, about four crew members, four astronauts, and, and living in an RV. So I think you know we've we've all experienced being uh, in lockdown due to COVID. How how trapped you can feel with with even your family members who you love, um, and so it takes a lot of patience and a lot of teamwork with the astronauts to have so many people in such a tight space, um, and you really got to be patient with each other and and and. Um, be be very courteous to everyone but but our astronauts are so great um they're such great people that that they do that without a problem and and they just work so well together as a team 
Yeah, that teamwork is 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 super super important. Um, it's a it's and your team is unique when you think about the different teams that we have at, at NASA within the programs. The Gateway team is a little unique, and um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about your team? Yeah, so the cool thing about Gateway is we're we're not a huge team. Where there's only about 25 of us that are in the core Gateway program, and we've got you know folks from across the the entire NASA agency. Um, so, for example, the the power and propulsion element, uh, we've got a great team out of uh, the Glenn Research Center up in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and then uh, Halo is being led out of uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston as well as Gateway, and the Kennedy Space Center is leading the effort on the logistics module. So the core team is 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 pretty small, and we like to keep it that way because that allows us to make decisions really quickly and make a lot of progress. Um, because we don't have very much time uh, to get this thing up on orbit. But then we've got an army of engineers across the agency um, helping us looking at every aspect of, of HALO, of PPE, of the whole gateway to make sure it's safe. And then we've got uh, one of the unique things is how much we're working with industry uh, and engineers in various companies from, uh, from across the agency to help build parts of gateways. So for example, the power propulsion element is being built by a company in California called uh, Maxar. Uh, Halo is being built by um, Northrop, uh, Northrop Grumman in uh, Virginia. Uh, SpaceX, uh, who I'm sure folks are, are familiar with, are, are building um, the logistics module. So again, it's this great team from across the nation, um, but we're trying to keep at least the core pretty small so that we can be very lean and mean and, and get a lot of work done. <laughs> that, I'm sorry, I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing at this question that Diane just sent me. So this is pretty, pretty cute. All right, Diane, ask question from Emma. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, she was wondering, do you build the models with Legos or on the computers? <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Is that <laughs> So believe it or not, I I like Legos. So all of the detailed design we have to do in the computers to get all of the detail in there, because eventually what you do is you take the model that you build in a computer and you turn it into a two dimensional drawing that you can hand to somebody so that they can go build the circuit board or write the computer program or cut the metal and assemble it all. So we've got to do it in computers. But again, talking about those early concepts, uh, what it, we do like, I like using Legos because I grew up using Legos. They're so flexible. Um, you can make just about anything and they really help you um, in that early concept development of how things will connect and, and interact. And then you, you move on. So one of the things that I like doing again is I, I'm an avid 3D printer person. So I'll take some of the models that we have and maybe print them at home because when you're trying to think, gee, how will, the, how will part A connect to part B? And oh, maybe we could do something a little different. It really helps to have those physical parts um, so that you, know, you, can, you can do that creative process and, and think through how things are gonna work together. That's really cool. So, so, so all the pieces of Gateway, we we know that they're obviously not made of light. Well, I got it. Let me let uh, me just say, give a shout out real quick to Emma and uh, her son out in Scotland. They've been drawing with me on my Zoom art camps and Zoom Art Academy for months. Good, hi Scotland. I'm so glad you guys are with us today. All right, so um, so we know that the gateway pieces are not made of Lego. So why don't you tell us what the real gateway is made of? What kinds of metals, composites? What would you expect? Maybe for the out, especially the outside part. I think that might be the most interesting. How do you protect um, the astronauts from the outside of space? So what's that hole made of? Yeah. So just like we talked about the Coke can, we actually build uh, much of gateway out of aluminum because it's really strong for how much it weighs. Um, and so that, that tin can, as I call it, but it's really a Coke can, is made out of aluminum. And then we layer that with various other pieces of aluminum. What will actually be on the outside of Halo are radiator panels. Um, and that's because these, uh, all of the equipment that you've got running to, to communicate back home with Earth and to keep the humans alive, to keep the astronauts alive, it gets really hot and you need a way to get rid of all that heat. And that can be a big, big problem in space. And so you end up covering it with radiator panels and, and you pass uh, that heat into those, again, they're just metal uh, aluminum panels. 
and then it radiates heat into space and that's how we get rid of it. And the, the nice thing about those panels is they also serve as a shield um, to the astronauts so that we call it MMOD, which is micrometeorite uh, objects. Um, uh, if that little rocks, essentially little space dust and space rocks, if they hit you, they're going really, really fast and they can put a hole in your spacecraft and let all the air out. So um, these these panels kind of protect Halo and, and will keep the astronauts safe while they're inside. Um, but because we are concerned about weight, uh, one of the other materials that we use is composites. So you think carbon fiber, um, because they're really, really strong for, for how much they weigh as well. So I know um, various parts of the spacecraft will use that where we can. Very cool. So, um, so People, when they think of space stations, they think of, you know, probably the International Space Station that orbits around the Earth. But the Gateway is very different from space, the space station, mostly in size. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the differences and maybe a few of the similarities, too? Yeah. So so the, the thing to remember with the space station is when it's got all of its solar arrays and its radiator panels and everything deployed, it's, it's about the size of a football field. Um, and I believe the, the, the space that the, the astronauts have to live in is about three bedrooms. So it's, it's a pretty big, relatively, uh, space for, for the astronauts to live. And that's because, you know, we do intend for astronauts to live there for, for long, long durations. So I think, uh, you know, typical is six months, so half a year. And, and as most people know, we've, we had astronauts on orbit for, for up to a year living on in space. And so when you do that, you need more room, right? So, so the space station, the International Space Station is, is much bigger than Gateway will, will ever be. Um, I think the important thing to remember about Gateway is, you know, it's, it's just the stopping point. It's like the rest stop onto wherever you really wanna go. So in our case, um, for, 20, for, for the moon, you know, where you really wanna go is down to the surface of the moon, but, but you stop at Gateway to make sure everything's working um, so it really only needs to be big enough um, to allow the crew to, to stay there a few nights, sleep there a few nights, um, move cargo in and out, uh, and to exercise, and, th and then head down to, to the surface of the moon. So it's going to be pretty small, and, and we want it to be pretty small, um, because that helps us uh, keep the cost uh, pretty reasonable. Because one of the things that we're very conscious about in, in this new effort is is trying to be very cautious of how much money we're spending. Um, and that's really so that we can go do the next cool thing, right? If we spend all the money on Gateway, there'll be nothing left to go spend on Lander and go do other cool things and, and explore more space. Yeah, yeah. And so you were talking about astronauts going to the surface of the moon, and Diane has a question about um, exploring the moon. Yes, Fatima from YouTube. She really wants to know, what do astronauts want to look for on the moon? Oh man, well, so the cool thing about exploring the moon um, is you can look at the different types of rocks that we've got. So back in Apollo, we brought uh, a lot of uh, geologists down to look at, and, we, and all of the astronauts, in fact, uh, learned a little geology. Um, but you wanna look at uh, how the rocks were formed on the moon. Uh, because that can really tell you a lot about how the Earth was formed and how planets form um, and really help us learn about the solar system that we're in. So in addition to looking for things like that, um, we'll send robots out and, and do exploration that way so that we can get, you know, longer term and broader swaths of the surface of the moon. Um, but there's all sorts of science that can be done that far out in space. Um, not only just about Earth and the moon themselves, but the solar system and, and the environment around the solar system. Um, so those are some of the, just a, a little bit of uh, all of the cool science that we're looking to do uh, down on the surface of the moon. Excellent, it's really exciting. I can't wait to see the launch of the Space Launch System and the Orion and then getting astronauts to the surface of the moon, to the gateway. There's so many exciting things happening um, in the next several years. All right, so as we wrap up, we've got a few minutes left. So, um, Mark, as do you want to do your uh, your closing spiel with uh, your uh, steam? Well, yay! So yeah, so while you're the... talking steam, I might go around and show everyone. Oh, my drawn. goodness, that was an amazing episode. 
I think I, this could be a two-hour episode. Listen to Brian and listen to Brandon about talking about his animation. With I want to just want to thank Brandon Ray. Thank you for making the time to come on, and I hope your kids, Violet Ray and Blue Ray, enjoyed watching. It was so oh, cool. Oh, they did. Yeah, they made the drawings too. Yeah, yeah Di Diane Kelly. Thank you for doing all the moderating, and uh, once again for for another episode, you did fantastic. Brian Banker, you're awesome. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, NASA guests, thank you. I just thank you. I, I could listen to you for hours and hours. Um, now, what I, what I wrote down here, I do this on every episode because of my belief and my passion for including art into our core curriculum goals, our our mission for all the schools through elementary through university around the world. Um, right now, there's a big push, which is a good push for for science and technology and engineering and math. Well, me, along with thousands and thousands of art teachers, believe that we need to stick art right in the middle of that acronym for full steam ahead. Science, technology, engineering, and art pulls it all together. Art creative thinking is the way that you're going to take all these very important subjects and put them together in an applicable form. You're going to be able to apply science to the real world, apply technology to the real world, apply math and engineering to the real world to solve real problems. And that's all through imagination and creative thinking. So it's full steam ahead, full steam ahead. Someone say, Yahoo. 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 And I, I see this Brandon's is... got his kids. Do, they did you are, guys bring here. your drawings? And my daughter Violet brought her drawing. Let me. Violet, oh, hi Violet. Out. Well, that's blue. I see blue oh, right down. I was going to put it on your webcam. Uh, you okay, can put here it we down. go. There you go. You put it down. Oh here. wow. That's amazing, Violet. Wow. I love it. Great job. I'll hold her up so she can wave. Wave it, everybody. <laughs> hi, <laughs> hi Violet. Hi Violet. Hi Blue. Give me a blue. All right. Hey, uh, I'm going to come to you, Jack. Oh, we got oh. another one. Here we go. <laughs> All right, Jack, I'm going to come to your drawing. Did, Tell did us a blue, little bit about it. Did Blue have a drawing? Did Blue have a drawing, uh, B Ray? Did... Oh. No, that's all right. No worries. That's all right. All right, Jack, I'm coming to you. All right. Well, so I'd, my favorite part of these is always coloring it in because I think that's where it really kind of starts popping and coming to life. So I will make sure that I finish this and I'm going to share it on social media with the hashtag DrawArtemis. And I encourage everybody that's watching and drawing along to uh, put Draw Artemis out there and share your work because we want to see everybody's creations. Awesome. And I want to see That's a Jack, that is a great drawing. All right, we're going to B-Ray now. <laughs> that's awesome. I love your little aliens going to visit the gateway and visit our, our NASA astronauts. <laughs> you think they get a warm welcome, Brian? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, he wants to know, are they playing video games? You know, we keep the astronauts pretty busy up there, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if I were an astronaut, I might sneak a switch up there or something for the little bit of downtime that I got and play some video games. Well, that's I what the hard time pulling myself away from the window. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I'd just be glued to the Orion window looking at the moon. <laughs> All right, Mark, well, I'm going to come back to you guys. And thank you, everybody. That was so much fun. Now, uh, again, Jack. Uh, said go put your share your work to uh, pound hashtag Artemis uh, also if you want to share it to Mark Kistler hashtag I'd like to I'd love to see him so on Instagram or on Facebook go ahead and do hashtag Mark Kistler too um, now this is you guys I just got this far in an hour I'll spend another couple hours on it and I'll put the background like I did on these okay and you could do the same thing or you can redraw them and add your own ideas add your own imagination morph it morph it into something even more spectacular uh, as Jack says chase your curiosity with your drawing remember uh, the, my main goal is to get you guys to give yourself the creative license to flop stress is on the bus because drawing is fun it's motivating it's inspiring and it helps helps uh, artists and and geniuses like you take what's in your imagination and build these things and create these things that are going to get us out to space and get us back to the moon and the mars i'll i just really really want you to do one drawing every day okay one drawing every day to get what do you think jack do you love that one drawing every day yep I'm going to give it my best Oh, yeah, shot. yeah, he's busy. He's busy. He's still yeah, busy. Yeah, he's, he's drawing his one drawing every day. <laughs> All right, well, let me, let me see. There's drawing. Mario. <laughs> let me, can you get my face cam? I want to get Mario. Mario, wave to everybody. He's ready to clean the uh, halo. He's ready. He's going to get his halo cleaning system together. 
And I want to thank everybody out there. Thank you guys for joining us. And we this is episode six. Uh, we'll let you know via Facebook and via YouTube and via Instagram when our next episode is. I just can't wait to do another one with you, Jack and Patricia. Thank you, everybody, so much for drawing with us. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. Well, many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, Earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wondered if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go.